We're in our final category here. Those, we have folks here who are gonna to talk to us about advocacy and systemic change. So Isabella and Alexis. Hi everyone. So I'm Isabella, I'm a senior here at U of A and I'm studying public health. I'll be graduating in a few weeks. Hi, my name's Alexis. I'm a senior and I'm graduating in, in December and I'm also a majoring in public health. I also forgot to say I'm an intern with the Snorin Center. Yes, the same thing too. Yeah. Okay, so, okay, so, let me just sec. Um, so our project will discuss understanding the needs of refugees with disabilities in the U.S. Um, our project title is Elevating Refugee Perspectives About Access to Disability Services in Arizona. So we had the opportunity to work on this refugee project this semester. And um, we have been gathering um, information and data that, sorry. <laughs> um, oh, it's like way harder being up here, but. Okay, we've been gathering information and data for refugees, and we've been doing extensive research to um, gather information and data for refugees and their supporters. Um, uh, we wanted to be able to find information that is inclusive and accessible. So let me start with some background information. Who are refugees? Um, refugees are people who have been, um, sorry, who have been forced to leave their homeland due to violence or conflict and persecution, and um, <laughs> so sorry. So refugees with disabilities face um, unique challenges. Um, there are pre-existing disabilities that people with disabilities, refugees that had disabilities before they were displaced, and then there's disabilities caused by displacement. So whichever the case may be, it is important that Refugees have access to healthcare and are supported while navigating this new world. So um, as for our methods, we did extensive research um, through these past couple of months to gather information that is accessible and inclusive for refugees. Um, we have a, a, we had a list of languages because refugees come from uh, um, various parts of the world. Um, there's hundreds of languages spoken, so we wanted to be able to be inclusive and have these resources provided um, in these different languages. And so we were able to do that. There was some difficulty because um, not, these languages, I guess, are technically a little bit more rare than English because a lot of the information we found was in English. So it was hard to, um, like doing a general search, it was hard to find the, the resources in multiple languages. And so doing more in-depth research, looking more locally and in Arizona, we were able to find um, a list of resources that is accessible and readily um, available for refugees. The other aspect of our research was to look at disability laws in these different countries. Um, disability is viewed so differently um, around the world and um, there's different like um, theories and ideas of what disability is and how to navigate and approach treatment and services. So, um, uh, we wanted to be able to pinpoint which languages, which countries have these different disability laws. So we took our list of languages and worked backwards to find which countries these languages were spoken in. And from there, we were able to kind of pick a country to focus on and look at those rules and regulations and see what services were out there and provided for that specific country. And then moving forward, um, we are able to better approach helping these refugees because we know what they have experienced and the circumstances that they have been through. So being aware of the specific situations that um, refugees have lived through allows them to, allows us to better approach helping them because we have that enhanced knowledge. So our process to this was to identify the social networks and support needs of this population. Um, we looked at like health resources, education, and the healthcare system. Um, we also researched on the different perspectives of cultural views on the disability in the countries of origin and the US. 
Um, uh, we also researched on the refugee and disability services throughout Arizona also. Um, I would also look at like different um, like programs that were offered throughout Arizona, mostly in Tucson. And the importance of it was to vastly diff uh, the vastly different views on disability from country to country based on, the, on your religion, gender, socioeconomic status, religious beliefs, and the disability type. Um, for refugees with dis disabilities face increased stigma and additional, um, sorry, additional socioeconomic disadvantages and the forced displacement disproportionately affects these persons with disabilities affecting their safety and livelihood opportunities. So just, re just trying to find research and uh, have a broader understanding of, these, of this population and how we can improve um, the resources and supports for this. Um, if you have any information, we have our contact um, on the bottom. And then we also want to thank Julie and JC for helping us with this project and um, doing everything that they can for us. Thank you. So we have a few presentations related to refugees with disabilities. So I'm gonna call up our diverse uh, policy fellow, Fernando. Hello, my name is Fernando Paredes. I am a graduate student in the mental health counseling and vocational rehabilitation program. And I'm also in the year long disability um, policy fellowship. So my topic is looking at different ways to support and advocate for school-aged youth, school-aged refugee youth in US school systems. So broadly speaking, schools are kind of conceptualized as a place where you spend large chunks of their day, maybe learn things like um, skills in the areas of like reading, writing, math, and other things. But overall, schools, whether indirectly or intentionally, play a really big role when it comes to promoting youth development, positive youth development. But when it comes specifically to school-age refugee youth, we're finding they don't always have the most equitable or inclusive experience. Um, so this is not an exhaustive list, but these are just a couple of areas where re school-age refugee youth face challenges in school systems in the U.S. <clears throat> One of these areas is not always engaging in youth programming. So youth programming, you could think about that as like an after school program, before school program, maybe something like a boys and girls club. Um, and all the research really shows that these programs have really positive outcomes, like increased academic engagement, more pro-social behaviors, uh, less juvenile delinquency, lower incarceration rates. So mainly good positive outcomes across the board for youth. But for refugee youth, they don't always engage. They tend to utilize these services a lot less for cultural barriers like uh, parents don't know about these programs, don't know how to access them, don't know how to enroll in them. So therefore, refugee youth don't engage in these programs when it could in fact benefit them. Other areas include uh, special education, special education law and implementation in school settings. So refugee youth don't always um, get the most inclusive or even accurate um, special education like procedures implemented for them. One of these um, that specifically stood out was uh, not always being placed in what is known as the least restrictive environment, meaning more like self-contained classrooms or not being placed with their same age peers when they are you know, just as academically capable, those kind of things. Or there's also uh, some trends of like being misdiagnosed with a learning disability simply because they don't speak English at a certain proficiency compared to their peers. Um, other areas include, the last kind of area is mental health because of some of their pre and post migration stressor, stressors like parental separation, uh, fleeing their country for a variety of things like war, civil unrest. They have higher rates of certain mental disorders like PTSD, anxiety, other forms of trauma disorders. But again, similar to the youth programming, this population tends to underutilize school-based mental health services. So kind of what can we do to help support youth? Again, this is just one recommendation that's come up in the literature, broadly speaking. Uh, don't know how well you can see that figure, but that is a pyramid model for comprehensive school-based mental health services. 
And at the bottom of this pyramid model is family engagement. So this could be things like greeting parents when they go to drop off their kids, uh, making sure they're aware of what programs are available, making sure there's programs available um, in their language, things like that. Uh, basic needs, again, you could think about that as like food, water, shelter, uh, safety, all those kind of things. So basically, and at the top of the pyramid, that's where we get to more emotional, um, behavioral, and academic supports. What this model is basically saying is that it is not really possible or feasible to address academic, behavioral, and mental health concerns for this population if you don't address these other areas in the pyramid. Um, so again, my project was really getting at um, advocating for policy change and re general recommendations for school systems that serve school-aged refugee youth. So in a nutshell, that's my research project. Okay, our next presenter is Cody and he is online. Thank you, JC. Hi, I'm Cody Newcomb. I'm currently a graduate student at the University of Arizona uh, as a disability policy fellow for this year. Um, I was focusing on accessible transportation for refugees with disabilities. Um, one of the main things I found was the majority of websites of state refugee programs it, throughout the country don't mention transportation or disability. Um, transportation is not just an issue for refugees, but all individuals with disabilities. Um, A lot of the issues that affect people's access to accessible transportation include geography, uh, especially if you live in a more rural area. If you live in, you know, like Phoenix or the Phoenix metro area, there's more access to public transportation as if you lived in Yuma or further north in Arizona. Um, neighborhood access, some neighborhoods it's difficult for public transportation to get access into, so it may be difficult for refugees in certain places to even be able to use transit. Um, English usually is a second or third, sometimes fourth language for refugees. Um, accessing transportation almost requires you to understand English or be able to understand the way we do transportation in the United States. Um, another issue that accessible transportation needs to be expanded because of is people do not seek medical care due to barriers. But to be able to receive services, especially dis for refugees that are disabled, they need to be able to regularly seek medical care or be able to make it to appointments that are required to stay on services. Uh, ac also access transportation lines require English. I, I think sometimes Spanish will work, but when we're thinking of refugees, that includes many different languages um, due to the regions refugees are coming from. Uh, so there's a need to have public transportation that can reach more rural areas. There needs to be creation of infographics, posters, and websites that are translatable and understandable 
not just language based, but for different cultures as well. Uh, there's a need to have individuals that can translate working at doctor's offices to assist in scheduling appointments if translation services are necessary. Um, and another issue is accessible transportation in America is very difficult because current infrastructure really requires you to own and drive a vehicle. For people with disabilities, a vehicle is, you know, at least 60 grand, if not more. So that price point makes it much, much more difficult to have access to something that, in my opinion, the Americans with Disabilities Act requires access to public, you know, to a public service, such as public transportation. And we're not seeing that access being required. And that's all for me. Thank you, Cody. And if you can hang on for just a, a second here, we'll give the opportunity to ask one or two questions for Cody since he is uh, in Phoenix and joining us from there. Do we have any that's either online or here in the room? Okay, well, you all have the opportunity to email Cody if you have questions later, if something comes up for you. So we're going to move on. Thank you, Cody. Thank you. Freya. Hello, I know we're almost done. Um, I'm Freya, I'm Freya Abraham. I'm a junior studying neuroscience and cognitive science. Shout out to the WA Frankie Honors College. I'm a part of their program and was recently accepted to their HEAP cohort. So even though I'm a junior, I'll be sticking around here for another five years or so. So what can I say? I liked it here. Today, I'm gonna to be talking about the research I've done with Dr. Julie Arman and her cancer equity group for my certificate in developmental disabilities. So why are we looking at cancer care access for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities? Well, Dr. Arman's group found something very interesting when they looked at the SEER Medicare data. It's data that's provided from several states in the United States on cancer outcomes for individuals who are in the Medicare program. And what they found is although people with intellectual and developmental disabilities are diagnosed earlier than the general population on average, their five-year life expectancy outcomes are worse. Why is that? So there is no magic wand we can wave to give us the answer, but what we can start to do is look at policies that may be impacting this. So where do we begin? What we did is we looked at two different kinds of states that had a large data set within the data that Dr. Armin already examined. So Kentucky and Georgia both had quality data sets and the difference between them that we wanted to look into is that Kentucky is a Medicaid expanded state, meaning that there is more healthcare coverage for people with disabilities and aged citizens and Georgia is not. So the first part of this project was doing a policy surveillance of the existing healthcare policies in each state. So those are the numbers you see in the center here. So in Kentucky, out of 89 healthcare state policies in Georgia out of 260. And so while these seem like widely did like disparate numbers, what the team found is that we were looking for healthcare policies that relate to cancer or disability. And we found that that was too specific of a term. So what we had to do was instead of looking at cancer care access, we had to look at both disability and healthcare access. This includes terms like transportation, specific treatments, and these kinds of broader terms that we're just looking to see what are the laws in place that are informing the way that people receive care. And so 
And keeping that in mind, 66 out of the 89 policies in Kentucky that related to health care met those criteria. And in Georgia, 28 out of the 260 policies that were examined met those criteria. However, policies on paper do not always reflect the care that people receive in terms of service availability, in terms of waiting lists for services. So another key part of what we want to do to help unravel why we're seeing what we're seeing is to ask service providers on the ground what they think policy strengths and weaknesses are in respective states. So what part of what I helped do was build this recruitment list of potential contacts, cancer and disability experts in both Kentucky and Georgia, so we can reach out to them and get their expertise and how things are run in their state. And so this spring, we've been identifying these individuals. This is an ongoing process. So we're currently hosting these qualitative interviews with these de-identified experts, and we are identifying different themes that come up in these interviews. We've compiled different fact sheets based on the policies that we've examined, in addition to state health policies, which are quantified in the center. On the corner, you'll see we've also looked at federal Medicare policy, state Medicaid policy, and state disability policy codebooks. This is so that when we interact with experts, we know what kind of policies they're surrounded by, we know what their language is going to look like. And so through these interviews, we've been identifying different themes, such as transportation issues, issues with reaching rural regions and quantifying the ways that services are provided post-diagnosis, which is what we're most interested in. And so I'm super excited to keep working on this project next year with Dr. Armin as well. We've also found some other things. I'm not sure how much time I have left, but in case anyone would like to talk about this further, please say hi to me at my poster. I'd love to see you. Thank you. Okay, last but not least, Summer, come on up. Hello everyone, my name is Summer Sison. I am a senior at the University of Arizona, studying public health and minoring in government and public policy. So my presentation today will be on analyzing the cost benefit association with the homelessness programming and interventions in the state of Arizona. During my internship with the Sonoran Center, I've had the opportunity to work alongside Austin Duncan, as well as Wendy Parent Johnson, and my peers at Arizona State University and Northern Arizona University on this homelessness study. Beginning August of 2022, the three universities started collaboration on the homelessness focus group portion. The objective was to identify common definitions and measures of transitions and to determine successes of each program and the relation to associated benefits in Southern, Central, and Northern Arizona. The team compiled a list of stakeholders based on community contacts, knowledge of the local environment, and research about the providers in the three regions, Pima County, Maricopa County, and Coconino County. Potential participants were identified and their research team worked together to strategically invite them um, to the regional focus groups. Each county then categorized their participants by occupation, either administration or providers, and scheduled multiple Zoom sessions throughout the month of October and November. Prior to the fo first focus group, the logistics of the studies were defined. Each site created two Zoom links, one for administrators, leaders, directors, and another for service providers such as frontline workers and community organizers. There were two co-facilitators per session, closed captions for participants, an introduction script for the facilitator, and a recording for the club. During these focus groups, a list of 20 plus interview questions were prompted to capitalize on rich discussion amongst providers and to push them to think critically about homelessness in Arizona. A list of demographic questions for the Qualtrics survey was also created to better understand the participants' background and to get payment information. Um, and each of the hour long sessions, one person was the facilitator and one was the note taker. And in some cases, a third team member observed the interview. The recordings from all 17 focus groups were then transcribed digitally. After the collection of materials, all transcripts were cleaned up and uploaded to deduce for further analyzation. 
members of the University of Arizona, Arizona State University, and Northern Arizona University split into two groups to code different qualitative and quantitative themes. I personally participated on the qualitative end where the team created a list of unified parent and child codes that were initially established to guide everyone's individual coding process. As the group encountered new themes, additional codes were added to the unified list throughout the months of January to March. Each transcript was reviewed by at least two different team members. After this process, using the uploaded, updated list of codes, a thematic analyst was conducted by creating a visual diagram that showed the relationship between codes and themes, which I listed down below. Um, as this project continues to progress, we plan to memo each of our graphing categories in order to provide clear data and information to the public. Thank you. Thank you, Summer. Okay, that was our final presentation. We're soon gonna open this up and folks can uh, mingle and ask specific questions one-on-one -on -one to um, our presenters that are here in the room with their posters, but we do want to have some uh, acknowledge all of the folks who have supported and mentored the students throughout the whole year. Um, we have faculty and staff members from multiple departments, including our own Sonoran Center, but from across um, in College of Education and um, in Family and Community Medicine, who are all here, um, and even from Northern Arizona. And so we just want to thank um, all of the faculty and staff who've worked with and supported our students this year, um, as well as the community partners who opened their doors and worked with us to support our students in their different um, projects. And of course, some of our staff who are doing a lot of the behind the scenes work from the communications team, um, as well as our administrative support. And, you know, on behalf of Selena and I, we just really want to thank everyone for your part in making today go well, but also for our students throughout the entire year. And so I'm going to leave this up while y'all are mingling. So if you haven't followed us, you, you heard from Carlos and Justin, like follow us on socials. We also want your feedback about our event today. And I want to thank and acknowledge all of our folks who are online because we will, um, your time has concluded while they mingle and network here, but we thank you for joining us online. Um, and I also just want to say, I just want to commend the students. I know it's not easy coming up here. I also get nervous, but all of you stuck it out. You did a great job, especially after the last couple of years with this pandemic. Y'all are fantastic. And we're so glad that we were able to do this and have a both hybrid and here in person. And so just thank you for all of your hard work this year. And I don't know, I'm just like, I feel like sometimes y'all are like my babies. I don't know, I have, I love y'all. I love working with all of you. And um, this has been such a fun year. And so get refreshments, go to your posters. I will also be stopping by to all of you to chat. And um, thank you for all coming today.